Hi, my name is Sam Witte. I am a postdoc at the Grappa Institute in the University of Amsterdam. And today I'm going to be talking about work that I've done in collaboration with Dion Nordhaus, Tom Edwards, and Krista Beniger on what I believe is likely the most promising way to indirectly detect accident dark matter. So let me start with a brief overview of, of what I'm going to be talking about since this is a relatively new and developing field. Uh, the idea is to take radio telescopes and to point them in the direction of neutron stars. Um, if axions constitute a large fraction of dark matter, and specifically I'm gonna be talking about the QCD axion, you expect to have large number densities of these axions in and around the neutron star itself. Now we're choosing to point at neutron stars for two reasons. They have large magnetic fields, uh, which are shown here in this dipole-like configuration in uh, orange, and they have this dilute plasma, which is shown in this these gray blobs. And in these environments, axions can very efficiently convert into photons, which we can then detect using our radio telescopes. Now, since axions in the galaxy are extremely non-relativistic, we expect the photons produced from these processes to generate a very narrow spectral feature centered about the axion mass. So this gives us a, a very unique signature, namely a na narrow spectral line emanating from the regions around the, the neutron star itself. Now, let me take a step back. Um, when people discuss axion dark matter, they mean many different things. I wanna sort of clarify what I'm talking about here in this presentation. Um, I'm showing a, a one-dimensional timeline, if you will, of, of axion dark matter mass in units of EV. Uh, we know that the axion dark matter cannot have a mass that's too small. Specifically, the mass can't be below about 10 to the minus 20 or so EV. Otherwise, you begin to modify structure on large enough scales. And this is inconsistent, for example, with observations from Lyman Alpha Forest. Uh, and, and the mass can also not be too large. Um, axions typically couple to electromagnetism, and this allows for a two photon decay process to take place. And so eventually, at large enough masses, this axion will decay very efficiently and it will become unstable in the course of the lifetime of the universe. Uh, for the QCD axion, as, as an example, this typically happens at about 10 or so EV. Um, and there are sort of three predominant candidates that people discuss typically. There are fuzzy dark matter candidates, which are the very low mass regime, sort of that modification of structure regime. There's the QCD axion, uh, which is expected to have a mass around 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 4 EV. And then there are axion-like particles, which are just a phenomenological generalization of, say, the QCD axion. Now, in this talk, I really want to focus on the QCD axion. To me, this is by far the most well-motivated candidate since this solves the strong, P, strong CP problem, which is one of the large, largest uh, outstanding problems in particle physics. Um, and also because we have a very firm prediction sort of for what the expected mass range should be for this particle. Um, it, you either overproduce or underproduce, depending on, on which side of the, the mass range you go to. But we have a very uh, good idea that the mass should roughly speaking be between about 10 to the minus five and a few times 10 to the minus four EV. Uh, and this is sort of sitting smack dab in the middle of the radio frequency band that we're talking about. So that's perfect for our types of searches. Now, how do we go and detect these axions? Uh, the most promising way is to exploit the coupling of the axion to electromagnetism. And the axion couples via this FF dual field strength tensor which is nothing more than a coupling to the combination of the electric field dotted into the magnetic field. So if we go to an environment where we have a static background magnetic field, what this tells us is that the axion can actually directly convert into a photon and vice versa. Now, the probability for this process to take place, as you might guess, is proportional to the coupling squared to the magnetic field squared. And by unit analysis, you can sort of guess that you're missing a factor of length scale squared. In the non-adiabatic limit, this length scale is going to be set by the coherence length of the axion and photon. Essentially, how, how far or how long do the axion and photon coherently oscillate, um, which is dictated by the momentum mismatch between these particles. Now, if I consider this process taking place in a vacuum with non-relativistic axions, I have a problem. Since axions are non-relativistic, photons are relativistic, this momentum mismatch is large, and this process will be extremely suppressed. I can dramatically enhance the efficiency of this process by going to environments in which I have uh, an effective photon mass. And this is something that naturally takes place in dilute plasmas. Here, you can effectively suppress this momentum mismatch if the effective photon mass, mass matches that of the axon mass, increasing the coherence length and increasing the conversion probability. 
So this tells us that our ideal targets are those in which you have large, large magnetic fields and dilute plasmas. Now, for this reason, we want to consider neutron stars. Neutron stars, as a reminder, are the final state evolution of 10 to 25 solar mass stars. They have a mass of about a solar mass, and that's concentrated into a radii of about 10 kilometers. Neutron stars have the largest magnetic field strengths known in the universe. Um, typically near the surface of newly born neutron stars, you can reach and exceed magnetic field strengths of 10 to the 14, maybe 10 to the 15 Gauss. Um, of course, that's it's enormously large. Now, if you take that magnetic field, this dipole magnetic field configuration, and you allow this to rotate around the neutron star in a vacuum, uh, you'll find that this, this configuration is unstable. The rotation of the magnetic field will induce an electric field at the surface of the neutron star that is strong enough to rip charges off of the neutron star itself. And those charges will uh, attempt to um, change the position and re rearrange themselves in a way to cancel that electric field. Um, and what that's going to do is gonna, it's going to generate this dilute plasma in the magnetosphere itself, such that the electron number density is typically expected to fall off like one over R to the cubed. So it gives you this large sort of radially falling off um, plasma distribution. And that's going to allow us to naturally scan for resonant conversion from these axions. Um, now, there's always going to be this maximum textable axion mass, which is going to be dictated by the maximum electron number density at the surface of the neutron star. And you expect that in most cases to be more or less around this 50 micro EV range, although there's some uncertainties related to, to what this should actually be. So feel free to ask me if you have questions about that. Um, geometrically, sort of um, the configuration of this plasma is going to have expected to have a shape more or less like what I'm showing here in this gray blob on the left, where you have this torus like configuration on the center, these domes around the north and south pole, and then you have these throats that cut in between the two of these, uh, where the electron number density is extremely small. Uh, now, the difficulty in these types of searches is that there's a huge number of uncertainties that enter the problem that we don't really have a good handle on at the moment. We have questions on large scale astrophysics, small scale astrophysics, plasma physics, and particle physics, and it makes the problem a bit of a mess. To give you an idea of what I'm talking about, um, in the context of the large scale astrophysics, there's always the questions in indirect dark matter searches about what the dark matter phase space is. Uh, how is it distributed in terms of the halo profile? Is it an NFW profile? Is it a chord profile? Is there a cusp in the center of the galaxy? Do axions exist in a smooth distribution or are, do they exist purely in uh, small bound objects like axion mini clusters? Um, we have a large number of questions related to neutron star populations. Uh, we have individual observations of some neutron stars, but most neutron stars are actually not observable. And this is problematic because we don't know how magnetic fields decay. So it's very difficult to understand how to go from, how to model this, this sort of unobserved neutron star population both in terms of spatial distributions and in terms of fundamental properties like the magnetic field, the misalignment angle, the period, all of this. Um, in the context of small scale astrophysics, we really don't under understand magnetospheres too well. Uh, sp specifically, we don't understand magnetospheres for extremely active neutron stars like magnetars. Uh, we don't understand what, for example, exactly whether or not there are relativistic or non-relativistic plasmas or where these exist in the magnetospheres whether or not there can exist non-poloidal contributions to the magnetic field, uh, whether or not you have very inhomogeneous features in the plasma distributions themselves, and all of these things can have important implications for the conversion process and the propagation of photons. And finally, this, this final category, which I'm going to call from, from photon production to detection, uh, we don't understand exactly how photons are produced in three-dimensional homogeneous plasmas. We don't exactly understand how to, uh, whether or not many of these photons undergo strong refraction, reflection, absorption, what the expected asymptotic distribution of these photons are, both in terms of the spectral features and in terms of the flux. Um, and so in this work, I'm really going to discuss this final category. I'm going to try to convince you that we really can, in the very near future, have a firm handle on all of these features uh, with the caveats that we need to make assumptions on some of these other categories, for example, about the, the features of the magnetospheres. Um, and, and really, we're going to be asking, you know, the question of how accurate is the current formulas and the analytic formalism that's been being used for the last two years? Uh, is the flux uncertain by a factor of, you know, two, a factor of five, or a factor of 10 to the five? Um, in order to elevate these indirect searches to something that is trustworthy and robust, we really need to, to really get a handle on what these uncertainties really are. So let me 
uh, discuss our process for dealing with this problem while I plan animation of our numerical code that we've developed for, to deal with all of these issues. Um, the first issue we have is, is what does the axion phase space look like at the resonant conversion surface? Um, in the past, people have made a number of approximations uh, based on the geometry of the axion phase space, for example, is by assuming all axions travel radially outward, which is not the case. Um, and this is important because the conversion probability is very sensitive to the, for example, axion velocity at that surface, at the conversion surface itself. So we deal with this by doing a Monte Carlo integration over the axion phase space directly at the conversion surface. We can then compute uh, directly the conversion probability of each individual photon, rather than uh, roughly speaking, categorizing the, the conversion probability in a, in a sort of approximate way. We then have developed a uh, ray tracing code that allows us to track the photons as they tra travel to asymptotic infinity. This allows us to deal with the refraction and reflection of photons, which induce anisotropies in the distribution of, of photons at large distances. During this ray tracing process, we can directly account for energy exchanges with the plasma. And this is going to allow us to directly compute the overall spectral features and spectral characteristics of the photon of the radio uh, spectral features. And, and finally, after we get to asymptotic infinity, we can go backwards, uh, follow the entire trajectory of each individual photon, uh, find out whether or not these photons are absorbed by calculating the optical depth and account for any other relevant microphysics, in particular physics, which suppress the efficiency of production at the conversion surface. For example, physics related to the production of these photons in three-dimensional homogeneous plasmas. Uh, so I'm showing this process on the left where this uh, red and blue and white object is showing the conversion resonant conversion surface around the neutron star. The neutron star is sitting in the middle here in a very small region in the center. And I'm showing a small selection of about 20 or so or 10 or so trajectories, photon trajectories. And if you look closely, especially here in the throats of the, the neutron star, you can find, you can see that many of these photons undergo strong reflection on very, very short distances. This imparts a large amount of energy to and from the photon uh, and induces strong anisotropies in the signal. Now, after we've gone through this process, we can collect all of these photons at asymptotic infinity, and we can use these to generate sky maps that characterize the radio signal. In particular, we can generate maps that characterize both the flux, the time dependence, the overall spectral uh, features as a function of uh, position in the sky. Uh, and if we go through this process, this is, for example, a sky map of the relative flux. So if you're sitting at the center of the neutron star and you look outwards at all angles, this is the flux as a function of these angles in the sky. This is in units of log 10. Uh, it's the relative flux, so the, the, essentially the flux in a pixel divided by the total flux. And what you see are these very narrow, these very bright, narrow um, flux peaks uh, coming through these, these bands here. These are corresponding to photons which have been produced and have been funneled into the throats of the neutron star where the electron number density is extremely low. So there's a strong funneling process due to refraction of the plasma that pushes these photons into these regions. Um, and what this tells us is that our observations are extremely sensitive to the viewing angle. Uh, we can also use these maps to generate time dependence of the signal depending on the observing angle. So here's five different realizations. And you can see that depending on the realization, depending on where you are as an observer, you may be extremely lucky. You may observe these bright flux, which can enhance your signal by multiple orders of magnitude, or you may be in an unlucky position and you may be observing a very, very low flux for a large fraction of the rotational period. We can play the same game using the overall spectral characteristics again. This is plotting the relative uh, fractional relative difference between the photon energy at asymptotic infinity and the axion mass. So in the event that there were no radio broadening, no, no uh, plasma broadening of the spectral line, we would expect this to be about 10 to the minus six. So in other words, we'd expect it to be all dark blue across the entirety of this map. Instead, we see that the bands, these bright flux bands are very much enhanced. In other words, they're very much plasma broadened by about an order of magnitude and a half in some cases. Uh, and, and the signal is actually broadened quite uh, more generally everywhere in the sky with the exception of uh, along the direction of the, of the neutron star tilt. I've also just taken three random pixels and, and plotted this, this function delta B, this relative fractional width of the axion and units of 10 to the minus five to give you an idea that we can actually do this on a bin by bin basis and we can do it in a relatively robust way.
of course, the key question is to what extent does this affect our sensitivity and have we been able to improve the robustness of these searches in some way? This is a projected sensitivity for the square kilometer array uh, for a, a number of observing hours on the mag magnetar sitting in the center of the galaxy. And again, assuming an NFW profile. Um, what I'm plotting here is the axion photon coupling as a function of the axion mass. We can see current constraints uh, from helioscopes uh, in red, helioscopes, direct searches in blue, um, and the QCD axion, sort of the expected range of the QCD axion in this green band here. And what I'm comparing is uh, our observations, which for which I'm plotting in black, uh, the minimum um, flux that you would expect depending on a position in the sky over a period, the maximum that you'd expect, so the maximum sensitivity you get if you happen to observe the flux in those strong flux bands, and uh, the result of marginalizing over that, that uh, uncertain viewing angle. Um, and I'm comparing that against the previous formalism that's been developed, the analytic formalism that's been used in all papers prior to this work. And what you see is that there are a two order of magnitude in some cases difference between the sensitivity, uh, the marginalized sensitivity and the analytic prescri prescription at low masses that corresponds to a four order of magnitude uncertainty in the flux um, that uncertainty is a bit smaller at larger masses, uh, but it's still quite significant. So what I'd like to emphasize is that this is a, the, the ingredients that we've included in this modeling, this forward modeling of the axion photon signal are fundamental, need to be accounted for in all searches uh, and can greatly change um, and alter the expected signature that we, we expect to get. Um, but I, I think the, the promising outlook of this is that we are sort of honing in on a more robust approach to indirectly use neutron stars to search for axions. Um, I'll conclude by just saying that there are still many open questions. We are working on many of these at the moment, and I expect to have a number of papers uh, with many of my collaborators um, and many other groups are still working on this as well. Uh, so hopefully we'll be, we will begin to address a number of these other uncertainties in the near future. Uh, we also have a number of observational proposal and data analyses um, uh, in progress. And so we expect to have you know, some new constraints coming out. Uh, so keep your eye open for those. Thank you very much.